in our Christian liturgical calendar, this is the last Sunday of the year. Next Sunday, Advent, is the first Sunday of the Christian calendar. So how appropriate that we end our Christian year focused on Jesus. Historically, the, the early Christian church had the highest view of Jesus. And unfortunately, at different points in history, that has been weaponized and used to abuse other people, particularly non-Christians. Um, as Christians, the more we can be like Jesus, the more we can love like Jesus, the better. And that, that's what uh, Christ the King Sunday is all about. So welcome once again this morning. Uh, to those people watching online on the internet, welcome. And uh, our greeting is on the screen. Uh, it's a responsive greeting. Uh, welcome once again. This comes from Jeremiah 23 and Luke 1. I'm going to read and you are welcome to respond. Christ takes care of us as a shepherd takes care of the sheep. Offering love and redemption, mercy and grace. If you're visiting with us this morning and you've never filled out a visitor card, they're in our uh, little wood boxes and it says welcome visitor. Feel free to grab one, fill it out, drop it in our collection plate just so that uh, you will know that we love you and, and we can reach out to you and thank you for coming. Our unison gathering for this morning on this Christ the King Sunday comes from Jeremiah 23 and Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 1. And this is a prayer for us to say together. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're visiting with us, won't you pray with us? Won't, we, won't you pray for peace and mercy and grace and a better world? Let's pray together. Holy and shepherding God, you gather us here to dwell in your love and grace. You comfort and guide us. You heal and redeem us. As we sing your songs of praise, send your light into our lives. As we commit ourselves to the ways of Christ, our guide, our ruler, our Savior, bless us with your presence. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. On this very chilly but grace-filled morning, as we're able, let's stand as we're able and greet each other with the peace of Christ and the love of Christ. Let us greet one another. <laughs>
Also, welcome back to Ron Creighton, who is, is the true Mr. Sowers B. So good to have you back this morning, sir. So. Uh, 
show of Oliver is at 2 o'clock today at Sydney High School. But we also have an ecumenical Thanksgiving service here at 3. So if you're going to Oliver, great. But if you're not, uh, many of our, our Tritown area clergy, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist, across the board, we're going to have an ecumenical service here at 3 for Thanksgiving. So if you're going to see Mr. Fagan, wherever Jack went, great. But if not, we do have that service here at 3. So with that said, if the kids want to come forward, and I guess we don't have Sunday school today, but what we do have back in our nursery is we have some coloring bags. So. <laughs> How are you? Good. So what's new with you? Nothing? How are you guys? Good. Good. So do you like my Yankees hat? <laughs> yeah, this is a Yankee. Is this a Yankees hat? No. No, what is it? Now, what, who wears a crown? Um, a king. A king? Do we have a king in this country? We have Burger King, but other than that, right? So, so a king or a queen, we just had Queen Elizabeth, remember she passed away, we're all sad about that, right? And now in England they have King Charles, and we don't have any kings in this country, but a king is somebody who has a lot of authority and sometimes a lot of power. And this morning is Christ the King Sunday, or Reign of Christ Sunday. Sometimes in history, kings or queens have been not very nice, but King Jesus, the one that we celebrate, is full of love, full of grace, full of mercy, and there's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. Does that sound good? Yeah. So no matter what you do, no matter if it's the worst day ever, no matter if school was awful, Jesus won't love you any less. Isn't that great news? So with that said, and I'm going to take this off because we don't want to mess up Pastor Paul's hair too much, <laughs> up, up, <laughs> up on the altar here, if you guys are willing to walk up with me real quick, I think we have 35 shoe boxes for our Operation Christmas Child, and these shoe boxes are going to go all over the world. They're going to go to Africa. They're going to go to Asia. Your school is doing that. Your school's doing that. They're going to go to South America. They're going to go to Central America. I think somebody told me last Sunday they had two boxes last year that went to Ecuador, and these are full of toys and soap and, and uh, things like that. All right, we have 36 boxes. <laughs> yeah, feel free to take it up. So what I want to do is I want to bless these, and then Melissa and I, before our ecumenical service, we're going to take them to the drop-off point, and these are going to go all over the world. And on Christmas, kids like you are going to open them. They're going to get toys and other things, and maybe they've never gotten a toy ever before. Can you imagine never having a toy? No. Never having a book? Well, we're very blessed in this country. And then when they open that box, they're going to hear that Jesus loves them. So let's go up. We're going to say a prayer. I just realized my cord doesn't stretch. So. <laughs> so let's pray over these boxes. All right. You ready? Lord God, we thank you for these boxes. We pray that the people that receive them would be very excited on Christmas, that they would feel your love, that they would feel the love of your son Jesus, and that this would be a transformative moment in their life so that the world might be transformed. Don't worry, I'll put the crown on the gun, I promise. <laughs> so just, just some announcements. Like I said, if you're visiting with us, feel free to visit, uh, fill out one of our visitor cards in the pews. This Sunday is Stewardship Sunday in addition to Christ the King Sunday. Um, I'm going to integrate that into my sermon. I, I usually call that portion of my sermon, Sermon on the Amount, uh, because we have pledge cards that are in our bulletin. So if you have a desire to give or pledge to our church and make it an official amount, uh, Melissa and I turned ours in a week or two ago. There's a wood box right in the middle there. It's called the Joe Ash box. The first two years, I thought Terry DeRoz called it the Jordash box. Jordash are pants, and Joe Ash is a character in the Old Testament. So feel free to put those in. We're going to pray over what's in there and our, our offering during the offering time. Um, but feel free to fill one of those out and get it in. It just helps us to figure out what our budget's going to be in the, uh, the coming year. So... As far as that goes, like I said, we have our ecumenical thanksgiving service today at 3. We're going to have people from St. Luke's, from um, East Guilford Presbyterian. The preacher today is Reverend Dr. Ken Samoro. Um, he's a, uh, a Lutheran pastor, I think, uh, by ordination. So that'll be at 3. I hope you can join us. It'll be live streamed as well. If you're not going to that, you want to go see Mr. Fagan at 2 uh, for Oliver at the high school. 
And I um, wanted to let you know as well that this Thursday our church office will be closed for Thanksgiving. Melissa and I will be headed to my parents uh, late Wednesday afternoon. So pray for my mom because she has to deal with me for, what, three whole days? And they live in the middle of nowhere, so she might need some psychotherapy at the end of that. Um, tomorrow we're doing our we're doing our Thanksgiving boxes. I know that uh, Carol Hubbard and the Robinsons aren't here today, uh, but from 11 to 1 tomorrow we'll be giving those out. And, and what a blessing that is. I think there's 80 or more people signed up in our community to get uh, a Thanksgiving dinner, so we're very uh, excited about that. This Wednesday, choir rehearsal goes back to normal after uh, at 7 o'clock, so if you want to be in our choir, I hope you can join us this Wednesday. It's a fun time. Um, like I said, if you can get your shoe boxes in uh, by today, there's a pickup time tomorrow from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., so it's really cutting it close, but we will deliver the ones we have today. Coffee hour after church down in the fellowship hall, thanks to Barb and, and the Rosses. Uh, uh, so, so much. Uh, um, it's very nice of you to do. Uh, next Sunday is a special giving Sunday in the life of the church on uh, Advent. It's United Methodist Student Sunday. That goes to help with student scholarships, and we'll have envelopes um, in our bulletins for that. Tomorrow night we have uh, our confirmation class from 6.15 to 8 uh, p.m. down in the fellowship hall. We have seven kids from different churches, so that's very exciting. If you know anybody that wants to join, let us know. Uh, our Advent reader list, because Advent starts uh, next Sunday, is pretty full. We just need someone to like the wreath at 11 o'clock on Christmas Eve. I know that's a hot slot. Uh, but if anybody wants to do that, um, just let me know. Our book study will continue for two more Tuesdays, and then we're going to take a break from study during Advent, and we'll pick back up in uh, January. Uh, we're going to decorate for Christmas briefly after the service next Sunday. I realize it's not a good idea today with a Thanksgiving service. It would look really weird to have a Thanksgiving service with all the wreaths and, and things like that. Uh, Ron and I will start this week at the Advent wreath out and some other things, but Hopefully we can finish the tree and everything together next week for anybody that wants to, um, to stick around. Um, two more announcements. Um, on December 11th, which is a Sunday, we're going to have our annual business meeting here in the sanctuary. Our new district superintendent, Reverend Bob Colbert Campbell, is going to lead our church and I think 10 or 11 other churches in our charge conference, our annual meeting. And that's going to be at 1 o'clock to about 2 or 2.30. So I hope as many of you can come as possible. And to sweeten the deal, uh, Melissa and I are doing coffee hour that day, and we're going to be providing a light lunch. So you can stay for coffee hour, and if you want, you can just hang out and then come right to um, our charge conference. Last announcement I wanted to make, and it's so good to see you here this morning, Rose. Uh, we will have services um, this Saturday for beloved member of the church, uh, George Womble. Uh, we're going to have a calling hour this Saturday, the 26th, from 3 to 4. We're going to have a service at 4 p.m., and then there's going to be a dish to pass after that. Rose, know that your pastor, your church, and everyone here loves you so much and know that we're here for you. So, any other announcements this morning? I only have 49, right? <laughs> so, all right, well, let's stand and sing on this Christ the King this Sunday and sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. So, number 327. <laughs>
Just some joys and concerns. I, I continue to follow closely, which many of you probably do as well, the war in Ukraine. Uh, just a, a catastrophic reality. Um, I think 10 million people in Ukraine have no power or limited power. It's cold there, it's snowy. Uh, pe some people don't have heat or running water. As we know, millions of refugees have fled the Ukraine into nearby countries, some of whom have found their way to the United States. Uh, as far as I have uh, checked, I think there's over 80,000 Russian soldiers that have been killed, well over 200,000 wounded, um, and this war is just uh, catastrophic. And, and I don't know about all of you, but it just sort of shakes my, my faith in humanity a little bit. Um, but I'm just praying, and, and they have every Sunday from the start, um, that Mr. Putin would come to his senses, would draw his military, and bring his soldiers home so that those families can be together, especially with the coming Christmas holiday. Uh, continued prayers for those people that have experienced hurricanes and, and natural disasters. I know it's all over the news, and you know we, we get worried about it. Maybe we send some relief money, maybe we do something, and then two weeks later we're on, on to the next thing. We're a very fickle culture in the United States, and we go from thing to thing. But there are still people that are, are struggling. We know that um, people are rebuilding. I know that our, our homeowner's insurance for our little camp up north went up, and that's probably in part because of building costs, but in part because of the incredible amount of natural disasters and all the destruction that's happened. Uh, prayers for our brothers and sisters in Buffalo area in the North Country. I think they got up, up to, what, 77 inches of snow? And we pray for them, but don't want that snow. So, so, and I think the Buffalo game today, they rerouted it to, to, to Detroit, right? Because even if the world is on fire, we have to have our NFL game. That's the reality, right? Um, but I saw the pictures, and it's just it, it, just unbelievable, you know? Two weeks ago, some people were walking around in t-shirts. It's just amazing how, how the weather can change. So just prayers for our friends out that way. I'm sure there's a lot of churches closed. Um, I, I'm sure that some people are without power. And, you know, it's just it's a very, very tough situation. Um, I did have on here Ron Creighton, but you're back with us today. So welcome back, sir. You're, you're feeling good. It's good to see you. Uh, Richard Derrick, um, he went to the hospital. Or he was he went to the hospital last Sunday. Um, he is back home now, and I talked to him Friday, and he said he's feeling uh, a little bit better. On Saturday, uh, Pac-34 and Troop 99-34, they completed their scouting for food, and down in our scout room down there, everything is sorted the, by by different category, and there's just an abundance of food. It is such an amazing blessing to follow the call of Jesus to feed people to give people something to drink, to clothe people. And I'm just so proud of our church. I'm so proud of our food bank. And we have people like my friend Mary Pizzelli who brings things over from the Lord's Table in Oneana. There's a whole bunch of stuff in our fridge and freezer. A lot of food down there, right, Mary? And there's a whole lot more to come. So, so we want to make sure that people in our community um, are fed. And it was a great joy, but it was also sad yesterday for those of us that went over to Great American and wished uh, Kyle Westcott uh, all of our best as they close their doors. Uh, Kyle gave a speech, and after all of that, Kyle said, come in and take some free greeting cards. After all of that, he was still very generous and, and still very loving. And, and in, an, in an effort to do just the little bit we can to honor Kyle's family and the workers, on Sunday, December 18th, at 1130 after church, I guess the pastor can't be too long-winded that day, right? Uh, we're gonna have a lunch just to thank the Westcott family and any employees of Great American, because they have done so much for us. So as a church, we're going to do something for them. So, um, so I hope you can I hope you can come on the 18th and stay for that luncheon. And uh, Dolores Navinger is going to help run that, right? Ma Matron Sane of the menu. That's what I call her because she does all these all these different things. Uh, those are all the joys and concerns I have. Are there are there any more this morning? Yes, Barb. Um, I like prayers for the family of Gary Smith. Gary Smith. So sorry to hear that. Okay, thank you for that. Any other joys or concerns? Yes, sir. Uh, pray for my in laws. The uh, mom has really hurt her back, and uh, my father in law has fell down on the front steps. Oh, no. Because it was icy here.
Char Charlie's wife Jessica owns a, a baking business, so if you want some good stuff, talk to this guy. Um, and, and, and by the way, I meant to ask you for an update, Charlie. What's it like to live across the street from your in-laws? Everyone loves rain. <laughs> well, pr prayers for them, prayers for them, and uh, please tell Jessica that, that, we, uh, that we love her. So, any other joys and concerns? Yes, Sarah. A friend of mine, Lost her husband suddenly Friday night. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you for that. From you, Matt. Sure. And, and continued prayers for the, the Wombolt family. Um, so so good to see you here this morning, Rose. A anyone else? Traveling mercies for all those traveling for the holiday. Traveling mercies for people traveling for the holiday. So, and my mom is very strict. Like, she'll, she knows I'm trying to go in to try something. She's in a different room. And she'll go, Paul, why are you touching? How does she know that? So she's like, it's not dinner time yet on Thanksgiving. How does she know that? All right, so traveling mercies. Anyone else? All right, friends. Well, on, on this Christ the King, King Sunday, Reign of Christ Sunday, would you join me in an attitude of prayer and meditation? Lord God, we live in a world that continues to have so many good and so many bad things. Hopefully this morning, however we arrive here, whether we arrive here rested and energized or tired and depleted, whether we are here with hope or lack thereof, hopefully we have a level of gratitude and thanks for everything we have in our lives. We have clothes on our backs, we have food in our stomachs, we have warm homes. Maybe there are things we want, maybe we have aches and pains, but your provision has been good. And since your provision has been good, God, we just pray that you would move us to extreme generosity. Not so that we can't take care of ourselves or provide for our own needs, so that we can extend your love and grace to others, so that we can continue to feed, we can continue to do all the things, that we can envision a country with no homelessness, that we can envision a country where everybody has enough to eat. God, we thank you so much, and we do know that there are people that suffer. There are people that suffer in Sydney, the state, and the country, and the world, and there might be people suffering here this morning. And if there are people suffering here this morning, may they know that your grace is with them. May they know that their church suffers with them, laughs with them, cries with them, and celebrates with them. God, we, on this day, we thank you for our church, the Sydney United Methodist Church. I thank you for what you continue to do in and through the people here. I thank you for the great love and grace that you give us. I pray that you would continue to grow and strengthen our church, not for our glory, but for your glory, so that we might continue to do amazing things in Sydney. With losing a massive grocery store, can we come together and figure out how to get people to another grocery store and make sure people are fed and clothed and do those things your son, our king, called us to do. We also pray for our neighboring churches, our sister churches, Sacred Heart and many of the other churches that will be represented by their clergy persons today at our ecumenical service. We thank you for all of the churches around here. Some days we scratch our head and don't know what the difference between a Luther and a Methodist or Presbyterian is, but what we know is they all love you and they all love your son Jesus. On this day, God, we, we pray for our men and women in the armed forces. We pray for all six branches of the armed services. We don't celebrate violence, we don't celebrate war, but we do know that we live in a world right now with a lot of danger. We live in a world right now that has some autocratic rulers who, because they have so much power, like a king does, they can order wars, they can order missile strikes, they can do terrible things. We pray for our men and women in uniform, some of whom won't be home for Christmas or Thanksgiving because they're deployed overseas. We pray for all the soldiers in our NATO allied countries. We also pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, and we pray that you would keep them safe. We pray for our police officers, our EMTs, our first responders, our firefighters, our teachers, our medical workers. Most of these people, Lord, are good people. They get up every day wanting to do well, wanting to honor you, wanting to make the world better. Keep them safe. On this day, God, we pray for the persecuted Christian church. Unfortunately, Lord, not every country in the world has religious freedom like we do in this country. There are countries where things are very harsh, and the religious options are limited to one. And we just pray that your grace and mercy would flow, so that people that are followers of your Son might be able to live that out, and live that love and that grace and mercy, so the world might continue to be transformed. On this day, we also pray for all oppressed persons and hurt persons, people that are continually called about their car's extended warranty, people that are, are swindled, people that are cheated people that are taken advantage of, victims of human suffering, victims of domestic abuse. 
God, you have called us to peace, mercy, and grace. May it be so. We thank you again for the great provision you've given us in our lives, and we continue to pray and reach out to those who suffer until you return in glory. And let us now unite our hearts, our minds, and our voices and pray that great prayer that your Son, our King, our Lord, gave us nearly 2,000 years ago when the disciples asked him, Jesus, how should we pray? And he responded with what we now call the Lord's Prayer. As you're able and willing, will you say this with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Terry, thank you for reading scripture this morning. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven me away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to them for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And our New Testament lesson is from Letters Paul to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 11 through 20. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. And now, if you're able, stand and join in singing our hymn of preparation. Come, ye thankful people, come. Found on page 694.
remain standing as you're able for a reading of the Gospel of St. Luke. Many churches, including ours, stand for the Gospel because we're reading the words of or attributed to our King, our Lord Jesus Christ. There are two optional readings this morning for the lectionary. One was Luke 23, 33-43, a crucifixion narrative. The other is Luke 1, 68-79. I'll be talking a little bit about that. This is a prophecy from John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, not the prophet Zechariah. It's very confusing. But let, let me read uh, Luke 1, 68-79. And this is page 54 of the New Testament of our Red Pew Bible. Feel free to follow along or look on the screen. And this is what the word says this morning. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has looked favorably on his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Thus he has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Once again, the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm going to talk a little bit about the gospel lesson and a couple of the other scriptures throughout, but mostly what I wanted to talk about today was kings and queens. How many here had a great admiration for the late queen Elizabeth II? It's fascinating to me because we fought a revolution to no longer be under the rule of a monarch, a king or queen, but yet our country has an absolute fascination with the British royal family. It's kind of a unique thing, isn't it? Whenever something happens with Meghan Markle or anybody else in the royal family, it's all over the newspapers, it's at the grocery stores, we're looking at it, we have to know what's going on in Prince Harry, right? And it's fascinating to me because our U.S. Constitution explicitly says that it's not okay to grant titles of nobility. I know we have Sir Paul McCartney and all that kind of stuff. We can't grant those kind of titles constitutionally in our country. It's not something that our federal law per, uh, allows. And because of that, we have elected government. We have democracy. It's messy sometimes. We know. We saw the recent midterm elections, and on Christ the King Sunday, every politician wants to pretend they're Jesus, and we're always sad when we find out they're not, right? But the late Queen of England is somebody that I've always had a great admiration for. Even though the Queen of England is, was the head of the Church of England, she still bowed before her king, which was Jesus Christ. And every year she would do her Christmas uh, videos that she'd send out to England and the whole Commonwealth. She'd say, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, you know. And I used to love watching those videos, and she would talk about the significance and the importance of who Jesus was and who Jesus was in her life. There's a show actually on Netflix, if you haven't seen it before, it's called The Crown. Anybody have seen that show? I know Melissa and I have seen it, and it's about the life of the Queen of England. We don't have monarchs in this country. We are ruled by elected officials. And when George Washington, our first president, was coming into office, there was a debate over what to call him, His Excellency, and we settled on president. We very much did not want to have a king or a queen to rule over us. We want an elected government. And we have this strand in our culture where we're kind of cowboys. We don't like taxes. We don't like the government telling us what to do. We're going to go westward and do what we want and do our own thing. We've always had this rebellious streak that's part of our culture. And I think part of that is because we have people that have fled religious persecution. They've come from other countries seeking a better life. And they acquired land. Unfortunately, they took it from people that already had it, the Native Americans. But the reality is we've always had this strand in our culture where we want to be completely free. And we don't want anyone telling us what to do. And because of that, I think it's absolutely fascinating that our culture has such a fascination with the British royal family, the one whom we fought to get away from, who we're now good friends with again. And then we have Christ the King Sunday and your pastor, very against the U.S. Constitution, has a crown here and put it on his head 
and said that Jesus was king. How can we declare that we have a king when we live in a country where it's illegal, according to the Constitution, to have such a title? Well, in my study of history, because many of you know I used to be a soul studies teacher, we've had many kings and queens throughout history. We've had emperors, we've had pharaohs, we've had all manner of these kind of people. Some of them are recorded as great leaders, some of them were tyrants and terrible leaders. What would it take to have a king that I would want to follow? What would it take to have a king that I would be willing to bend the knee to? That king would have to be perfect. That king would have to be righteous. That king would have to be full of grace and mercy. And that king would have to be a king that loves every person on the earth equally. And for me, the only king I have found worthy of that title is Jesus. And when I read the Gospels, when I study them, when I read what Jesus did and how he lived, he turned away nobody. He went to the least, the last, the lost, and the excluded people. He went to the sick. He went to those people that society said, don't go near them. Nobody loves them. They're unworthy of grace and mercy. And Jesus went to them anyway. I think, in my opinion, if anybody's worthy of the title king, the only one I can think of is Jesus. Now, Queen Elizabeth, I think, was a good queen, but her king was also Jesus. It's fascinating to me in our reading this morning from Jeremiah that we have this prophecy written years before Christ about this right, righteous one who would come among us. And I think some people get this hard because they said, well, Pastor, if Jesus came 2,000 years ago, why is the world still, still so messed up? Well, one of the responses I can give you, it comes from the time where the British were resisting the uh, people in India from becoming independent. For those of you that remember Mohandas Gandhi, remember that man who helped to liberate India from British oppression, he was a Hindu, and he said something like, it's not an exact quote, he said, I love your Christ, but I don't love your Christians, because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Jesus came and taught a revolutionary way, new way of love and mercy and grace. And if we embrace that, if we embrace that as Christians, with the understanding that our neighbors might not have our same beliefs or same faith, but we're supposed to love them radically anyway then we will truly be Christians. We can truly go before this king, this leader that we have, and we can truly love in the ways he's called us to. And imagine, friends, imagine if the world loved that way. Imagine if everybody in the world, whether they had a religion or they had no religion, imagine for the next 24 hours if we were committed to radically loving our neighbors. What would the world look like if we did that? And because of who this Jesus is and because of what he's taught, he is worthy of the title king in my heart. I bend the knee to him because I believe he is worthy to be praised. I believe he's worthy to be king, even if some of his followers don't always live up to that. Jesus is our king, and according to Paul in the Colossians, he's the head of the church. In him the fullness of God dwelled. He's the most perfect person that's ever crossed into this world. He was exceptional. He was phenomenal. As I've said in sermons before, I have talked to people that have problems with the church, but I've never heard anybody have a problem with Jesus. I've never heard anybody go, you know why I'm not going to church anymore, Pastor? Why not? Because of Jesus. I just don't like him. Usually the reason people stop going to church is because of conflicts or hurts or things like that. Lord Jesus, our King, what he has called us to is radical in its heart. Turn the other cheek. If someone takes your coat, give them your shirt too. If somebody steals from you, don't ask for it back. The radical love that Jesus has called us to, if we can pursue it, I think gives him the title of king. I think earns him the right in our mind to be crowned in a country that has no titles of nobility, no titles of royalty. Jesus, in my heart, is the only king I'll ever have. Because what he has done for me and what he has taught and what he continues to do every day is so radical and so transformative. In our gospel this morning, Zechariah, with an A, not Zechariah, who's a prophet, the, uh, the father of John the Baptist. After John the Baptist is eight days old and he is circumcised and they do the whole Jewish ritual for a young boy, he gives a prophecy of this one who's to come. This one whom his son, John the Baptist, will prepare the way for. This one whom we know as Jesus. 
And as I said, so many people look at the world today and they say, but pastor, it's so broken and all of these other things. And some of the complaints and the pushback I hear sometimes, well, if there really was a loving God, then insert. But what I would say to that is Christians, if we have the love of Christ in us, then we have the mission of the church in us. And we are called to take that mission into the world. We are called to love radically and boldly. We're called to feed people. We're called to do all of these things. And when we do that well, some of those people will see us and go, I don't know who this Jesus is you follow, but I think I want to follow him too. Because if he's that radical and he's that loving and he's that transformative, maybe I want to be one of his followers too. And that, my friends, is why we have on this Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, the last day of the Christian calendar, a celebration of all who Jesus is. Who is the head of the church? Not me. It's Jesus. Who are we supposed to love like as Christians? Jesus. If we're being terrible, mean, and harmful to people, then we lose Jesus. The Christian church is built upon, centered around Jesus. If only we had a, we do have a stained glass window. Jesus, right? In closing, uh, I know that, Jenny, you have the remote this morning, right? So not, not just yet. I have a video. It's kind of intense. I saw it years ago at a men's retreat. This is taken, it's an excerpt that was put together from a, a, a late pastor from South Carolina, a very vibrant uh, black pastor, S.M. Lockridge. And what he was trying to do in this sermon was condense all the things in the scriptures that Jesus is. And why as Christians, we love Jesus, we follow him, and on this Sunday, we declare him to be our king and our leader. So Jenny, whenever you're ready, you might have to look at the volume of this.
disease couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. If anybody is going to have the title of king over us, for me, the only one worthy of that is Jesus. My hope and my prayer as your pastor and for all of us is that we can be more like the Jesus that was just described in that video. And if we do, if we do that, imagine what Sydney and the world's going to look like. Let's not just be the church. Let's not just be a building. Let's live like the, the leader that we have, Jesus. Let's love boldly and care deeply. And if we do that, then we will truly be kneeling before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, friends, God is good. And all the time, we give because God has given so much to us, and we give because we believe in what we are giving to. So let us give to God our tithes and our offerings. And I'll go get the Jordash or whatever that thing's called. Go ahead. <laughs> God, the God of us all, the lover of our souls, the God who loves every single person on this earth and loves them all the same. We thank you this morning on this Christ the King Sunday. We thank you for your son and his love and his grace. And God, I pray in this moment that that perfect love that you put in your son Jesus, that it might transform our hearts and our minds and us even more. That when we get ready to depart from this place, that the perfect love and hope that, we, that has been instilled in us will extend out into the world, that the world will know us by our love, that we'll love more deeply, more fully, and more grace-filled, so that the world might continue to be transformed, and the world might continue to know the great love in your Son, Jesus. God, I pray for our tithes and offerings. I also pray for all of our pledge cards and our stewardship cards, and I pray, God, that uh, those stewardship cards and all of our offerings might be sufficient to cover our expenses in the coming year. 
We praise and thank you in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I also just realized too that I got so caught up in my sermon that I didn't really preach much about giving, did I? Um, so what I what I would say is uh, every time I see the commercial for St. Jude's, my heart melts. Anybody feel that way? And not just because you get the free blanket. Uh, but what I know is this, friends. We give to what we believe in. I believe in this church. I believe in our mission. I'm excited that tomorrow we're going to feed dozens of people Thanksgiving dinners. And because of that, it's worth giving to. So if you haven't filled out a pledge card yet, I'd encourage you to do so. You can get it at Terry or Barb Doyle. Um, so let us give generously as God has given to us. With that said, our closing hymn this morning is 102 in our United Methodist hymnal. Now thank we all our God. Let us sing to the God we love as we are able. Thank you. doesn't create any junk. And when God made you, he didn't make any junk. Jesus loves you more than you can imagine. There's nothing you can do right now to make God love you more. Take that love and take it into a world that desperately needs it now more than ever. Friends, be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hope you can join us for coffee hour downstairs. Also, if you want to come back here at 3 or go to see Mr. Fagan at 2 up at school at the Oliver, we'd love that. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you on this Christ the King Sunday. We thank you that when the world gets crazy, when things get nuts, that we can always turn back to your son Jesus. That we can always turn back to what he taught and how he lived, and we can be reinvigorated to do the same. May we depart from this place after we go to coffee hour, and may we, uh, may we go and live the life of Jesus. May we love like him, may we care like him, so that the world might be transformed. In your loving name we pray. Amen. Amen.